So coming up, we have Gold Bull Resources, Nevada Exploration, uh, the company fresh off the presses has announced a, a PEA on its project. So uh, here to give us a little more of the story is Sherry Leiden, CEO. Take it away, Sherry. Good morning, everyone. I'm here to present an update on Gold Bull Resources. Gold Bull is a Northern Nevada focused exploration company. Uh, our technical team and myself are all based in Northern Nevada, so we're very hands-on. And Gobel was born uh, during COVID uh, via uh, or after an extensive search for gold projects in the state. We appraised over 100 projects and came up with the Sandman asset as being our preferred. Uh, we created Gold Bull and essentially purchased the Sandman project from Newmont uh, for US $4 million cash. At the time, it had just under 300,000 ounces. So we saw that as a, a rather safe bet given that it already had the ounces. But for us, what attracted us to Sandman was its exploration potential. And uh, we're looking for multi-million ounce uh, deposits, targeting essentially another sleeper deposit uh, like we just heard about. And we feel that Sandman uh, ticks a lot of those boxes. It's consolidated uh, checkerboard, which is hard to find and a prime epithermal uh, district to be exploring in. We're looking um, to become a near-term producer, and uh, that's essentially been born out of gold not behaving how we anticipated it during COVID, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Listed on the TSX under the ticker GBRC and also on the OTC under GBRCF. Our share price is only 10 cents uh, Canadian, giving us a market cap of about $10 million Canadian. And uh, at the current um, PA numbers, we've got an MPV pre-tax of US $190 million. So we'll get into that disconnect uh, in the next couple of slides. We have two projects that are both 100% owned. Uh, Big Balds uh, is a drill ready exploration asset south of Elko. And if we've got time, I'll, I'll end on Big Balds. But Sandman is certainly where the majority of the focus is. Uh, ESG is a core commitment um, to myself and our team. And uh, I go back quite a while with our team. Craig Perry and I used to work together at Rio Tinto more than 20 years ago. And uh, we're both ex-Rio and driven by those ESG values. Craig, uh, I'd call him a serial successor. He's been involved with a number of uh, discoveries recently, uh, including ISO Energy, Next Gen, um, more recently, Skeena uh, and Regina Malloy uh, is our technical guru. She's the one that's leading our team uh, in Nevada. Uh, XBHP relocated uh, to Reno for this role. Uh, and uh, myself, I'm a geologist by background as well, and um, former CEO and founder of Battery Minerals, and now focused um, primarily on Gold Bull, also a director of Hog Ranch. And uh, if you're looking for some copper exposure, check out Rex Minerals. They've got one of the very few shovel ready copper assets on the planet located in South Australia. And my team, uh, Walter Coles is the CEO of uh, Skeena. And um, Skeena is one of those examples of what we're all striving for, taking a 20 cent stock to you know, $8 or whatever it is at the moment. And that's ba based on an asset that he acquired from Barrick. So we're trying to replicate something similar with the asset that we've acquired from Newmont uh, and really feel that there's immense exploration potential uh, that they left behind. Newmont uh, purchased Frontier for the Long Canyon asset and during uh, that acquisition, uh, they acquired or ended up with a Sandman asset and uh, the Sandman asset did not fit um, the geographic radius for the Nevada Gold Mines joint venture, which is why it was uh, Newmont's resource asset located outside, which allowed us to go for the asset late in 2020. So the Sandman property, We've been pretty busy since we acquired the asset. Uh, initially, we added some ounces and took the resource from 300 to 500,000 ounces, illustrating that there is resource uh, extension potential. Uh, the first year we drilled uh, 33 holes for almost 6,000 meters. Last year, we drilled 24 holes for 5,000 meters. And essentially what that's saying is the more we drill, the more ounces we're going to add, but drilling isn't cheap. And we've got to the point where 
we were adding ounces and seeing our share price depreciate and the company's value go down. So we took a step back and said, well, if we're not going to get value appreciation via spending money and adding ounces, well, let's look at the economics based on the current resource base. And we're fortunate that we do have uh, just shy of half a million ounces. And those half a million ounces have been based on almost 2,000 historical drill holes along with our uh, modern 50-odd drill holes. So you know, to replicate that at today's cost would be over $30 million of work that's got into it. On top of that, courtesy of Newmont, we have what's called a plan of operation. And in the US on BLM uh, land, it's pretty easy to get a notice of intent to disturb less than five acres, but it's not so easy to get a plan of operation. It takes years, costs millions, and all that work has been done for us. And they've um, done a wonderful job at completely blanketing uh, the environmental surveys and the cultural surveys. So uh, for a junior coming in, we don't have to spend those millions ourselves redoing all that work. They've even gone to the point of doing hydrological and hydro monitoring wells that, again, we can access and, and use. So for us, that was another um, reason, reason why investigate a PEA, because the lengthy uh, permitting, lengthy um, monitoring work had already been done. So we announced our PEA last year looking at above the water table only ounces, all oxidized. And when you're talking about above the water table, typically you can permit uh, a mine under what's called an EA, presuming your disturbance is small. So we're, we're looking at a phase one uh, approach to get us into production as soon as possible. And then during production, continue that environmental monitoring for below the water table and do that in parallel because that takes a couple more years. So it's the conveniently located next to the mining town of Winnemucca. It takes about half an hour to drive from Winnemucca to Sandman. Uh, Winnemucca supports Nevada gold mines operations, really mining friendly uh, part of the state. We believe that the corridor, the geology is very similar uh, at our projects as it is at Sleeper. We've got similar type rocks, similar age rocks, uh, similar structures. And we've engaged a couple of epithermal gurus such as uh, John Wood, who is accredited to discovering Sleeper and also Simon Meldrum, another epithermal expert. And essentially, um, paraphrasing these guys, they, they've, they see the current resource at Sandman as essentially being a lot of anomalism spread over a, a large distance. And that's evidence that there's a bigger system at work here. So we initially, we're looking for a new discovery, a new sleeper cell deposit. And, and that was until we changed our tack to the PEA. But ultimately, we're really quite motivated to continue exploration in parallel to the feasibility study, um, which will come next. We are authorised to disturb up to 500 acres. And uh, that's an incredible acreage under a plan of operation. And again, courtesy to the Newmont budget for that environmental monitoring that they did at the start. Uh, currently, you know, we're disturbing less than 30 acres at the moment. So just to put into context, the amount of um, disturbance that we have up our sleeve. We're also, it's important to note that we're fully bonded for our disturbance. So for, at the moment, we've got about a million dollars cash um, sitting with the government. And again, that's the same for any project on federal land in the US. You have to bond before you can disturb the ground. And that's why we've got the best ESG policies in the world. I was in Washington last week and most politicians didn't actually know that mining and exploration companies have to bond for assets. So there's no chance of any exploration company leaving the US in a in a you know messy state and not doing their rehab. We spend a lot of money on bond and that's part of the allocation of our cash resources. So these are the exciting numbers that we just released yesterday. So this is based on our PEA or scoping study, uh, which is done at a, a plus or minus 30 percent um, sensitivity level. It's a, it's a ridiculous um, IRR and MPV, uh, you know, 100% IRR, $145 million MPV, and that's at $1,800 gold. If we were to use our current gold price of $2,000, it's about $190, uh, sorry, $190 million MPV and a payback period of just less than a one year pre-tax. Uh, this is nothing complicated about SAM and um, projects. These, the resource is currently 494,000 ounces. Uh, these numbers are based on 455,000 ounces, which are our pit constrained ounces. Uh, we've used very conservative uh, pit slope angles. Um, same for our recovery, we presume 70%, although our metallurgical test work to date has been um, just over 80% average. 
It's a 35 to 40,000 ounce per annum operation um, that will go for nine years, the first five being above the water table and the second, um, the last four below the water table. All of our resources are open. So we believe in parallel to production, we'll be adding ounces and this is a pretty conservative case. But you know, looking at these numbers, uh, it's really inspired me to essentially recommend to the board to go straight to feasibility study. Um, I don't see a need for a PFS. Ultimately, all the PFS aspects would be covered in a feasibility study. The initial capital uh, to create that project is $29 million US. Uh, and uh, we, we proposed two small heap leaches, uh, one in the north and one in the south. And our all-in sustaining costs are just over $1,200. Sandman is very sensitive to the gold price. Um, you know, operating costs and capital costs don't really alter the economics, but when you start playing around with um, different gold price numbers, you can see the drastic difference. So in our study that we announced yesterday, we used 1800 as the current long-term average for $145 million NPV, 2000, what the gold price is today, 192 million. And yeah, you can just look at this graph on, on page 14 to see the sensitivity analysis with the gold price. It's, essentially um, the driver of economics at Sandman. And I don't, I don't think we'd be developing Sandman at less than $1,800, but uh, you can certainly see the positive impact that it, that it has uh, each incremental $200 increase as gold increases. Uh, so this is a couple of uh, summaries of our best hits that we got last year. And these are just sensational numbers, uh, all oxide material. And to have 13 metres at 20 grams a tonne uh, from you know, 40 metres is, is just sensational. But we put these out, the share price went down, and this is essentially why we've decided to pivot and look at the near-term economics, because otherwise we keep drilling, it's just going to be more and more dilutive to our shareholders uh, when there's not a bull market and when we're not seeing the share price appreciate with you know, ounces added uh, we're very lucky to have some major shareholders, uh, including our board of management. Uh, we've got the Flannery family office out of Australia, and uh, our major shareholders are fully supportive of getting into production sooner rather than later, given we're not getting that value appreciation uh, for additional drill holes. But that said, a number of these intersections uh, remain open, and we're, we're run by a board of management that have generated more wealth based on exploration success. So we're, uh, we're not giving up on exploration, we're just pausing it right now while we look at the feasibility aspects of the project. The exploration potential uh, is currently being investigated on the ground. We've got our geologist, Will Strong, and uh, he's playing around with soil gas and spectrometry uh, technology. But basically these gold deposits leak vapors and we're uh, currently trying to ascertain whether some technology that we're using on site right now is going to be a cost effective means of exploring our massive land holding. You know, our um, current land holding is approximately 20, uh, 25 kilometres by 10 kilometres. And uh, we've already got existing geocam, but because a lot of it has uh, unconsolidated and mobile sand dunes, the geocam uh, can't completely be trusted. So. We're using, uh, we've used geophysics, uh, 3D IP works very well, but it's expensive. So now we're currently playing around with this soil gas and um, spectrometry because it is low cost. So we'll know over the next few months whether that works. We're starting with our known gold deposits. And if that picks up the known gold well, then we'll apply that to the entire land holding and, and probably beyond that as well. So it's just a space to watch. And it's nice to see our industry that's actually having some new technology to, to play with because we've been doing it um, the same way for a very long time. So the current focus is very much uh, looking at the Sandman feasibility study. We've just got the um, the PA numbers as of yesterday. So uh, the, the 43101 accompanying that PA will be going out and then we'll be essentially costing out what is the feasibility study going to cost and how quickly can we get that done to essentially permit the project under an EA and uh, get it into production sooner rather than later. In parallel, we've got the soil gas technology and, and the spectrometry that's happening right now. And um, we'll know, you know within probably a month whether that's going to work on a broad scale or whether that's not going to be the magic tool that we're looking for. And, and if not, lag sampling, which is essentially taking fragments of rocks instead of uh, soil, has proved effective from a geochem perspective in the sand dunes. It's just a lot less mobile. And 
um, essentially came, came closer to the source. And I'll just quickly skip to our big boards project located south of Elko, because in my opinion, the, the immense exploration potential that exists in the US is essentially going to be undercover. And coming from Australia, where 100 metres of sand cover is normal, uh, it's just been astonishing that there's so many good projects that are vacant because of a bit of cover. So Big Boards is one of those projects that's located a long strike of Bald Mountain Mine. And Bald Mountain is an operating asset owned by Kinross, 5 million ounces. And it's located on the on the junction of the Carlin Trend and the Bider Trend, two, you know, probably two of the most prolific gold trends on the planet, is Big Boards. And Big Boards has never received a drill hole. Again, if Australia, if this was in Australia, I'd have a hundred holes uh, being in such close proximity to five million ounces. But essentially where the where the outcrop stops, the drilling stopped. And we've got pediment. And uh, we've conducted geophysics, magnetics, and gravity to determine that the cover um, is approximately 50 to 100 metres at Big Balls. Uh, we've defined what looks like an intrusive body uh, with, with a very similar uh, signature to what we're looking for, which is a lookalike bald mountain uh, signature in the geophysics. And we've permitted Big Balls under a notice um, of a tent. So this is a drill ready project. It's going to cost about half a million dollars and you're either going to have a winner or a loser. We've got a geophysical anomaly, so is that thing mineralized or, or is it not? Uh, Diamond Peak to the west uh, has an outcropping copper gold um, occurrence on it. It's high grade sticking up in the, um, on the, in the mountain to the west, and then right in the middle, we've got big boards. So that's one that I'm, I'm really dying to drill. Um, however, it's competing with Sandman for fund allocation. Sandman, you know, we know we're going to hit immunization in those drill holes and half a million dollars goes a long way in our feasibility study. So it's just not at the top of the list right now, but it's certainly one that I would like to see a few holes in sooner rather than later. But for now, it's just in the holding pen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sherry. Do we have any questions for Sherry? Yes. That's correct. We have not updated our resource estimate since 2001, and we have drilled about 5,000 metres subsequent to that. So, yeah, that, that is correct. Yeah, so a number of those holes were located within our pit shells, and then there are also a number located outside the uh, outside the pit shells. And our announcements try to elaborate you know, which holes clearly were outside the resource estimate to indicate that the resource is growing in the right direction. But our board made the decision to not announce incremental uh, resource increases. So, for example, rather than um, announce every 100,000 ounces, we'd rather wait for a more meaningful uh, resource estimate increase. And uh, at the moment, I'd say it's incremental and uh, we would like to see a pathway to a million ounces and we're not at a million ounces at the moment. So that's why we've chosen to rather than you know, every every year announce another 100,000 ounces type thing, uh, we'd rather you know come out with a, a, a more major stepping stone. None on this particular slide. Uh, we have announced, uh, last year we announced a number at Abel Knoll uh, where we got broad um, broad intersections outside, same at North Hill uh, and Silica Ridge, but none of these ones, the best ones so far have been within our resource. And we drilled those targeting high grade feeders. So the previous model was low grade oxide at the surface. And then with John Wood's input, we decided to drill deeper within the known resources to try and set a geological contact where we thought there would be a, a pressure release point. And we successfully hit that in a number of these. Uh, and again, just never received the, um, I guess, the support on market to keep chasing those up. Uh, for example, the, um, the hit at, at Abel Knoll, the six metres at 10 grams a tonne, that's the high-grade feeder, that's the core of a breccia pipe, and that's open. So... 
you know, what we want to do is put a hole that goes another 100 metres underneath that hip, and we haven't done that yet. So that one, um, that high-grade hip is not included in the resource um, just because there's only one hit and that's not enough a confidence to include that one one high-grade hit in, in our current resource. So we need a couple of more drill holes to really add some significant ounces to these current resources. Uh, at Able Knoll, the water table is at about 120 metres. Yes, that's the only, yeah, exactly. That's the only high grade for hole that we've got in that feeder. And it's the breccia pipe that basically is a zonation, zoned. And as you get to the core, it gets higher grade. And what's required is basically stepping back. We suggested an RC pre collar and then diamond tail that goes through that breccia pipe and really explores you know, the grade at depth. And that, that's where you're going to get ounces added when you're stepping back 100 metres below this hit. And Abel Knoll was one that was discovered 20 years after the, the other three um, deposits were discovered. Geologists had been driving over Abel Knoll every single day for two decades. And uh, it was the geochem anomaly um, uh, that was, I think it was like in, in the 2000s, whereas the rest of the project was discovered in the 1980s. So just that, for me, that gives us hope that there are more Abel Knolls out there. And again, Abel Knoll is completely open. And Abel Knoll is probably the one that's most similar um, to Sleeper from a geology perspective. Yes, we are. We are the um, the 3D IP did a very good job of highlighting alteration, and uh, we've got a lot of agularia flooding uh, in this system, and uh, it really did pick up that nicely. What it unfortunately doesn't tell us is the barren uh, alteration versus the mineralized alteration. So we saw some really nice looking rocks in a couple of the exploration holes, which are essentially barren alteration. Um, so it's again we're, we're trying to. We're trying to layer these scientific data sets such as the lag sampling uh, with a 3D IP and now investigating these soil gas uh, technologies because quite frankly, our problem right now is we have too many targets. And you know, if, if I was wearing my Rio Tinto hat, I'd spend $20 million drilling them. But as a junior on a shoestring trying to spend $2 million, it's a point of how do we narrow down our targets and our anomalies that have been derived by the geophysics and the geochem to date. Yeah, absolutely. And the nothing. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work. But you know, ultimately, when we when you've got major shareholders, uh, including the board, willing to put more money in, we can fund ourselves uh, getting to that point. Whereas you can't keep funding yourself explore, exploring and. Basically, money in goes money out, so at least a pathway to production um, preserves that shareholder value. Yeah, sure. It, yeah, this this was um, a talking point with my board. So five percent is what is currently being used by most in Nevada. Uh, however, we felt with um, raising inflation and interest rates, it was a bit optimistic. So we, we played around with the numbers and we thought, well, although 5% is about the average that's being currently used, we, we felt 6% was more realistic in line with the interest rates that we're seeing now versus what we were seeing last year. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Sherry.